Thank you. Thank you, Pat. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure to be with you today. As you know, uh, this is, I guess, the first of the conferences for our non-career executives, but it's part of a, a broader program that we like to think of uh, as an integral part of, of building and continuing our management team. And we look at you people as being very important parts of that management team. As a matter of fact, uh, perhaps one of the most important links in the chain that starts with the president, of course, at the top and goes through our structure and connects what the president is trying to do with the people, most of whom are career people, who are carrying out the services and the obligations of government and who are the ones that most of the time come in contact with the citizens. And so the management positions that you have, the executive positions that you have, are the absolute key in translating the policies of the president into what really happens in government. And at the same time, providing the monitoring, the oversight over what is really going on in government. And that's why uh, we appreciate your attendance here, are glad that you've been able to participate in this, and hope that it's worthwhile to you. As a matter of fact, I'm sure others have, have mentioned this to you, but we would really like to have your feedback as to the value of this type of a conference, uh, the good things about it, the things you think should be improved, whether it has been helpful to you, and other offshoots, uh, additional types of gatherings such as this that you think might be worthwhile. I appreciate the chance to be with you. Uh, I think in a moment we're going to be visited by the highest inside White House administration authority. <laughs> and so. And so I thank you for the chance to be with you. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Please. Oh. Thank you. I'm running out of time. I have to go to Houston. I heard that. <laughs> So, this unnamed White House source <laughs> thanks you very much, and thank you very much for taking time out of what I know must be hectic days to gather here like this. I know it wasn't easy because I know that you're the ones who implement the strategy and guide our policies over the pitfalls and the hurdles. You don't always get the glory when your efforts succeed, but let me assure you, I think all of us over there in the House know you're, you're out there. And I'm grateful for your loyalty, your hard work, and your commitment to the cause. On behalf of all your fellow citizens, I want to thank you for your service to our country. I know that sometimes life gets a little frustrating as we try to change a government that's fixed in its ways, but don't lose sight of all that we've accomplished. Our program, or our progress, I should say, has been I think significant. We came to office uh, vowing to renew America. Our economy was rapidly sliding into recession when we got here. I know back during the election months, I was trying to remind some people there when the opposition was saying we were totally responsible for the 10 point something or other unemployment. And I tried to remind the people out there that of what the unemployment level was when we got here and said, I'll take responsibility for the 2.4 that's happened since we've been here. If you'll take responsibility for the seven point something or other before we got here. Inflation had been running at double digits two consecutive years and back-breaking interest rates crippled American business, jobs, and families. And since we've been here, we know that inflation has plummeted. In the first quarter of this year, inflation was lower than in any comparable period in almost 25 years. Interest rates are less than half of what they were, and the leading economic indicators have been up for the last 
seven months. And we've begun what I believe will be a healthy and sustained recovery. And I told a group the other day that the most significant of all the economic indicators was the fact that they're no longer calling it econ Reaganomics. But we still have a lot, of, a lot to do, as you well know. We came to office promising to rebuild America's defenses. We made progress in the first two years, but not enough to make up for the decade of decline yet. It seems that convincing the Congress of the threat we face is one of our toughest battles, but we won't give up. It's our solemn responsibility as temporary custodians of this government and of all our duty as citizens to make sure that America is strong enough to remain both free and at peace. And you know, I have, of course, an opportunity to see some of the differences that have come about from when we first arrived here. For one thing, the difference in morale, the esprit de corps of our military today uh, is something that chokes me up whenever I see the examples of it. Uh, with all the talk of having to forego pay cuts and everything, I opened a letter one day and it was signed by more than a hundred Marines stationed in Italy. And they said, if that's what it takes to help our country, count on us. We'll do without. Anyway. It also seems that our tax cut and indexing won't be safe until every phase is completed. I happen to believe that our tax incentives were critical to the sustained recovery and we won't abide with any tampering of them. The third year of the tax cut is scheduled to take effect in July. Tax indexing will benefit small business and the average working man's family the most. Their repeal, as has been advocated by some of the critics in Congress, or even their delay, would be a cruel blow, an unfair attempt to steal the just rewards of those Americans who've carried us through the recession and into this recovery. I will veto any attempt to get rid of those two tax cuts. And our social policies like prayer in school, tuition tax credits, anti-abortion legislation have yet to be passed by the Congress, but we'll keep right on pressing uh, for their adoption. We're, uh, we're determined to renew America's moral spirit as well as our economy, and I think that is a hunger that's out there among our people, that there's a hunger for a kind of spiritual revival, for believing in something once again in this country. But these next few months are going to be critical to our programs. We've been struggling for a long time and I know it gets tiring. We can't weaken now. We must continue the crusade to return basic American values to American government, free our people to create a new era of growth and prosperity that brings better times and new opportunity for all. And that and the preservation of peace and freedom for our children are our highest aspirations. With your continued support and help, I know we can do it. And I thank you for that. And now I think maybe we've got a few minutes here before I have to leave for Houston that you can do what you've been doing and ask some questions. And I know that some of you must have said at one time or another, boy, if I had a chance, would I ask him? <laughs> yes. Uh, Mr. President, uh, I understand no president has ever been at a graduation of the United States Air Force Academy. Uh, this, this year is the 25th graduating class. I wonder if you could make a special effort, effort to attend. Well, I have to confess one thing. The, with all that they say about the power of the president, I still haven't discovered where that paper comes from every night that tells me what I'm going to be doing every 15 minutes the next day. <laughs> but um, I didn't know that no president has done that. And as an old horse cavalryman who in World War II found wound up flying a desk for the Air Force, uh, that'd be pretty appropriate. <laughs> I'd like to do that. Uh, now there's two hands almost crossed. I'll take the one in the dark suit and then the one in the light suit. <laughs> Mr. President, I really don't have a question for you. Just an observation as somebody, as several people here, many people here, 
have worked for you so many times, so many years in the past, and we just want you to know that if and when the time comes, we'll be there better than we've ever been before. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Now, okay. All right. now the uh, Mr. President, a lot of what we've heard over the uh, excellent past few days in the seminar has had to do with communication. Uh, you have provided in this administration the best example of a communicator, uh, but it has all often been frustrating to us uh, that you have not uh, taken that role upon yourself more often on television, speaking directly to the American people in the way that you do so very effectively. And I'm wondering if in the coming days you plan to uh, make appearances of that nature more frequently. Well, when we think they will be effective. There is a danger of overexposure, and uh, I don't want to run that, uh, that risk. But um, I do believe that where there's an, an evidence that the, the public themselves, such as this one the other night on Central America, was because the polls reveal that the public out there just doesn't understand what the situation is. And uh, we thought that the best way to, uh, to get the word to them was that. Uh, I can't resist. I know we're limited for time, but I have to tell you, all of you get an opportunity to communicate. And I once heard one of the greatest examples of communication. It takes more than a willing speaker and a willing listener. And this was told to me by Danny Villanueva, who used to place kick for the Los Angeles Rams and then became a um, sports announcer. And he told me this story, that he was over at a young ball player's house one night for dinner, ball player with the Dodgers. The young wife was bustling about getting the dinner ready, and the baby started to cry. And over her shoulder, she said to her husband, change the baby. He was a young fellow, and he was kind of embarrassed about this whole thing in the front of Danny. And he said, what do you mean, change the baby? I'm a ball player. That's not my line of work. And she turned around, put her hands on her hips, and she communicated. <laughs> She said, look, Buster, you lay the diaper out like a diamond, put second base on home plate, put the baby's bottom on the pitcher's mound, hook up first and third, slide home underneath, and if it starts to rain, the game ain't called, you start all over again. <laughs> brought up the Air Force. Uh, my dad flew for 24 years and I have a brother flying B-52s and another one flying C-130s in Germany for you and they were thrilled to have you there in Germany. I'd like to urge you as people begin looking at the defense budget that you don't let them cut out spare parts and maintenance. <laughs> Part of their flying is this is how you fix the plane when it's in the air and with uh, four or five B-52 crashes in the last several months I have a lot of concern about that. I, I think you all heard that about the, the maintenance and supply. I know of one instance of a B-52 in which something flying a low-level mission, practice mission, and something went haywire with the uh, turn and bank indicator and showing that there must have been familiarity with that same kind of accident before. The pilot uh, squashed a, a soft drink can under his heel, picked it up, and somebody handed some tape out of the first aid kit and he jammed it in and put the, used the tape and they fixed this while they were in flight. When we came here, we were astonished. I'd been talking all during the campaign about the decline in our preparedness. We were astonished at how much I had underestimated it when we really had access to the facts. And much of it had to do with spare parts and maintenance. At any given day, approximately half of our planes, our aircraft, military aircraft, could not fly for lack of spare parts. And the same was true in the Navy for ships, that there were ships that couldn't leave harbor for that or for lack of, of crew. Uh, no, we won't let that be cut down. We think that one of the most important things in the defense budget and in the improvement we've made is what we call readiness, the money that we're spending on readiness so that in an instant's notice we would know that uh, we could respond. And uh, I think, of course, that uh, I regret the delay that took place before we came here in the replacement of the B-52 with a, a more modern plane, because 
Uh, I have an uneasy feeling about some of the accidents that are happening uh, from men that are flying planes that are older than they are. Mr. President, is it uh, possible that uh, we could let Reagan be Reagan for the next two years before you went again in 1984 until having to wait afterwards? <laughs> I have in mind particularly the Department of Education pledge that you made during the campaign. Well, uh, <laughs> you know, I can't answer about anything except the next two, but uh, I just finished doing, um, Usually I do my Saturday radio noon broadcast uh, live, but because of this Houston trip, I have just finished taping it, and it's on the report that we've just gotten back from the special uh, commission. And uh, that special commission's report is, again, an eye-opener uh, for everyone, and I hope the people will get uh, familiar with it because it records the greatest decline in quality of education in this country, when you stop to think that in a number of very telling examples of education, 19 of them that are characteristic of education in our industrial allies and the, the countries we do business with and so forth, Americans now do not come in first or second in any of the 19 but come in last in seven of the 19 as to quality of education in these various 19 uh, separate <coughs> components or divisions. And uh, we're going to press forward on the, the findings of this, of this commission. And it isn't that the kids aren't, any, aren't as bright. Uh, we know better than that. It's just that we're not stretching that muscle inside here anymore. Uh, homework that averages less than one hour, uh, letting them take uh, voluntary courses instead of having compulsory courses, and they're recommending a uh, great increase in the compulsory courses, and properly so. No kid going to high school, for example, uh, is aware or knows inside himself what it is that he might, what direction he might want to go, and it's only through being compelled to take a variety of these courses, including math and science and things, that they can make up their mind. And I can remember, even though it's a long way back, I can remember in school uh, sorting out in physics. I knew within the first three months of physics I didn't want to be a scientist. <laughs> uh, but I saw other kids that in the same class with me that suddenly uh, you saw the bug hit them and they were fascinated and they were going in there on their own time for, for additional experiments and so forth. And this is what we must we must recovery. I think that letting somebody graduate for X number of hours of driver training, I've even found they have courses in uh, bachelor living. Uh, and it, it, uh, I don't think that stretches their mind very much. We have time um, for one more question. Oh, well, yes. Similarly, I'd like to work myself out of a job at the Department of Energy, but uh, I think that people stick it uh, stick with you if you try to not only reduce the growth of government, but actually reduce the size of this monster. And we're certainly ready, willing, and able to help if you can agree. Reduce the... Not only, not only reduce the growth of government, but actually start reducing the size of this monster. Oh, listen, that's, that's my dream. I dream of the day. I dream of the day when finally we can get out of these deficits, balance that budget, and then the day when you can submit a budget that is smaller than the one the year before. And that should be our goal. Uh, could I just take that? Uh, and that was we used to say to each other, when we start talking about government as we instead of they, we've been here too long. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you all very much.